Chapter 6 of Days with Great Poets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marie Hoffman. Days with Great Poets by May Clarissa Gillington Byron. Chapter 6 A Day with Elizabeth Barrett Browning. The year is 1858, the month June. The scene, Florence. Overhead, the pure, illimitable space and pause of sky, intense as angels' garments, less blue than radiant. Below, the wakening city, cathedral, tower, and palace, piazza and street, the river trailing like a silver cord through all. And where the romantic old palace of Casa Guidi holds the corner of a narrow street, there is a stirring of sound and life within its majestic medieval rooms. A child's tones are audible here, and a man's deep notes there, and a shrill, sweet tenuity of voice bespeaks the presence of the house's mistress, that infinitely small, infinitely remarkable personality, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, has begun another blue day, and a short time sees her seated at breakfast in the great room of the palazzo, her husband and boy beside her. The woman of women, as Harriet Martineau has termed her, is a most slender, fragile, ethereal specimen of her sex. The smallest possible amount of substance encloses her soul, declared Nathaniel Hawthorne's wife, I was never so conscious of so little perishable dust in any human being. Long dark curls, drooping heavily over her pale small face, almost conceal the large dark eyes through which her passionate soul looks out, those eyes of extraordinary expressiveness and luster. The rich bright coloring which was her conspicuous charm in youth is wholly vanished under the touch of prolonged ill health, so that... It seemed no sun had shone on me. So many seasons I had forgot my spring. My cheeks had pined and perished from their orbs, and all the youth blood in them had grown white as dew on autumn cyclamens. Above, my eyes and forehead answered for my face. Open parentheses, Aurora Lee. Close parentheses. What now remains to the woman of middle age is less the beauty of feature than the loftier beauty of expression which renders her so singularly attractive to all who know her. Her form, inconceivably slight and attenuated, appears still more so by reason of her habitual black silk dress. Altogether, what with her tiny exquisite hands and feet high sweet voice and fairy-like figure, she has a touch of the unearthly about her. It would be hard to find another human frame which seemed so nearly a transparent veil for a celestial and immortal spirit. Yet this delicate little creature is she who, flinging aside all fetters of physical weakness and social convention, slipped out of her father's house to join her secretly wedded husband, and to take flight with him by land and sea, on that memorable day when, in her own words, nobody backed me except the north wind which blew us vehemently out of England. But the erstwhile hopeless invalid, the lonely poetess shut up in one shaded silent room for years, is now a devoted wife, a happy mother, her woman's destiny fulfilled, and all the simple joys of life within her grasp, for she and her husband are ideally mated. A happier home and a more perfect union than theirs it is not easy to imagine, and this completeness arises not only from the rare qualities which each possesses, but from their adaptation to each other. Moreover, their happiness is crowned in the possession of a darling child, Panini, as his pet name goes, who in his mother's words is like a rose possessed by a fairy. Panini, now nine years old, slim and graceful as a sprite, 
is the very embodiment of grace and charm, a modern Ariel, tricksy and delightful. In Casa Guidi, six beautiful rooms and a kitchen, three of them quite palace rooms, according to Mrs. Browning, this contented family are living for nothing or next to nothing. We scarcely spend three hundred pounds, she has told her friend Miss Mitford, and I have every luxury I ever had, and which it would be so easy to give up at need. And Robert wouldn't sleep, I think, if an unpaid bill dragged itself by chance into another week. Nor does the palazzo itself suggest poverty in any form, rather a refined and eclectic abundance of beautiful, if not costly, things. The great drawing-room in which they are sitting, and which Mrs. Browning inhabits all day long, is so lofty and spacious as to provide almost too massive a setting for her dainty, tiny little person. The walls, whence pictures of saints look down out of ancient carved black frames, are hung with many-colored tapestries, from solemn bookcases filled with learned books, small tables piled with modern volumes, past heavy antique furniture, quaint old mirrors, curiously wrought chairs, by busts, casts, portraits, paintings of every date, the eye turns through dark shadows and subdued lights to the flower-decked balcony without, and the tall grey church of San Felice opposite, quite unlike anything to be found in England, and yet not wholly Florentine for people of such strong individuality as the Brownings must perforce imbue their surroundings with a certain aura of distinction, a sense of something unwanted and unusually alluring. Breakfast over, Robert Browning, alert and handsome, leaves the room with his light, quick step to seclude himself a while in his favorite retreat, the long room, crowded with plaster casts and studies, where he is assiduously laboring to profit by the tuition of his friend the sculptor Story. For he is not writing much at present, only very fitfully. Robert is peculiar in his ways of work as a poet, his wife has observed. I have struggled a little with him on this point, for I don't think him right. That is to say, it would not be right for me. Robert waits for an inclination works by fits and starts. He can't do otherwise, he says. One may conjecture that the reception or non-reception of his poems in England is hardly conducive to a steady output of work. His wife allows as much. The treatment in England affects him materially. I don't complain for myself of an unappreciating public. I have no reason. But the blindness deafness and stupidity of the English public to Robert are amazing. Nevertheless, she heaves a little sigh as he vanishes out of sight, for she is a firm believer in what Balzac called la patience angélique du génie, in working steadily, not awaiting the desultory descent of the divine if ladies. On the opposite page, there is a poem entitled the Love Boats. It's taken from a romance of the Ganges. The maidens lean them over the water side by side and shun each other's deepening eyes and gaze adown the tide. For each within a little boat a little lamp hath put and heaped for freight some lily's weight or scarlet rose half shut. The river floweth on open parentheses, a romance of the Ganges, close parentheses. She has toiled with unremitting industry of brain and intensity of feeling since the time when, as a young girl, she threw herself with whole-souled pathos into her portrayal of those impassioned watches on the Ganges bank where the maidens leaned them over the water side by side and shun each other's deepening eyes and gaze adown the tide. For each within a little boat, a little lamp hath put, and heaped for freight some lily's weight, or scarlet rose half shut, the river floweth on. 
of a shell of cocoa carbon each little boat is made each carries a lamp and carries a flower and carries a hope unsaid and when the boat has carried the lamp unquenched till out of sight the maidens are sure that love will endure but love will fail with light the river floweth on open parentheses a romance of the ganges close parentheses if i fail ultimately she has avowed it will not be because i have shrunk from the amount of labor where labor could do anything i have worked at poetry it has not been with me reverie but art poetry has been as serious a thing to me as life itself and life has been a very serious thing there has been no playing at skittles for me in either a woman who in her twenties was publishing translations from aeschylus might justly claim the credit of industry and not only has elizabeth barrett browning labored with a high motive and indefatigable resolve but she has undergone to a full extent that process of pang and travail by which poets are shaped to their ends she has been taught to know bitter pain of mind and body paralyzing bereavement anguish of hopes deferred before she could realize in their entirety the sublime uses of poverty and the solemn responsibility of the poet and has told the tale in her own way thus what was he doing the great god pan down in the reeds by the river spreading ruin and scattering ban splashing and paddling with hoofs of a goat and breaking the golden lilies afloat with the dragonfly on the river he tore out a reed the great god pan from the deep cool bed of the river the limpid water turbidly ran and the broken lilies a dying lay and the dragonfly had fled away ere he brought it out of the river high on the shore sat the great god pan while turbidly flowed the river and hacked and hewed as a great god can with his hard bleak steel at the patient reed till there was not a sign of the leaf indeed to prove it fresh from the river he cut it short did the great god pan open parentheses how tall it stood in the river close parentheses then drew the pith like the heart of a man steadily from the outside ring and notched the poor dry empty thing in holes as he sat by the river this is the way laughed the great god pan open parentheses laughed while he sat by the river close parentheses the only way since gods began to make sweet music they could succeed then dropping his mouth to a hole in the reed he blew in power by the river sweet 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 o pan piercing sweet by the river blinding sweet o great god pan the sun on the hill forgot to die and the lilies revived and the dragonfly came back to dream on the river yet half a beast is the great god pan to laugh as he sits by the river making a poet out of a man the true gods sigh for the cost and pain for the reed which grows never more again as a reed with the reeds in the river open parentheses a musical instrument close parentheses but now panini climbing upon his mother's couch and ensconcing himself cosily beside her preludes his lesson time with a shower of kisses just as she has described in aurora lee how i with shut eyes smile and motion for the dewy kiss that's very sure to come from mouth and cheeks the whole child's face at once dissolved on mine as if a nosegay burst its string with the weight of roses overblown and dropped upon me and after a few celestial moments of such endearments as are only known between mother and child she sets to work upon the instruction of that restless little spirit 
for poets' children must do their lessons the same as other folk. And although Panini is a born linguist and intelligent beyond his years, he is quite as apt to fidget and wriggle and kick his heels as any little boy that ever crept like snail unwillingly to school. His mother devotes an hour and a half daily to this necessary labor of love, and it is quite as much as her slender strength permits. But she is not one to begrudge herself in anything to the duty of the moment. Ever ready to accord sympathy to all, taking an earnest interest in the most insightful and humble, thoughtful in the smallest things for others, she gives little thought to herself. Panini dances away to the great square anteroom with its large pictures and pianoforte, and there takes his seat to tinkle softly up and down the keys which he dignifies by the name of practice. Mrs. Browning, left to herself, has a new claimant on her attention, for her faithful spaniel, Flush, making the most of opportunity, curls up beside her on the sofa and indulges in all the outward ebullitions of canine affection. Flush, a gift from Miss Mitford, has a most absurd resemblance to his present mistress in his large brown eyes, long silky curls, and spiritual cast of countenance. Flush loves me to the height and depth of the capacity of his own nature, Mrs. Browning has declared. If I did not love him, I could love nothing. He is as innocent as the first dog when Eve patted him. If he sees a ghost at all, it is of a little mouse which he killed once by accident. But this emaciated invalid, his mistress, has nothing of the hypochondriac in her nature. She can dare to touch the tremendous issues of the drama of exile, to raise the unanswerable questions of confessions. She, this puny, feeble creature, can describe with the spirit and vigor of personal experience that final and tremendous tragedy in which the Duchess May justifies her life and love, while her enemies burst through the breaking doors and her husband reins his steed on the great east tower. Back he reined his steed, back thrown on the slippery coping stone, toll slowly. Back the iron hoofs he did grind on the battlement behind, whence a hundred feet went down, and his heel did press and goad on the quivering flank bestrode, toll slowly. Friends and brothers, save my wife, pardon sweet in change for life, but I ride alone to God. Straight as if the holy name had upbreathed her like a flame, toll slowly. She upsprang, she rose upright, in his cell she sat in sight, by her love she overcame. And her head was on his breast, where she smiled as one at rest, toll slowly. Ring, she cried, O oh, vesper bell in the beechwood's old chapel, but the passing bell rings best. They have caught out at the rain, which Sir Guy threw loose in vain, toll slowly, for the horse in stark despair, with his front hooves poised in the air, on the last verge rears amain. Now he hangs, he rocks between, and his nostrils curdle in toll slowly, and he shivers, head and hoof, and the flakes of foam fall off, and his face grows fierce and thin, and a look of human woe from his staring eyes did go, toll slowly, and a sharp cry uttered he in a foretold agony of the headlong death below. On the opposite page, is the poem Duchess May's Ride from Rhyme of the Duchess May. She upsprang, she rose upright in his cell, she sat in sight, by her love she overcame. And her head was on his breast, where she smiled as one at rest, toll slowly. Ring, she cried, O oh, vesper bell in the beechwood's old chapel, but the passing bell rings best. 
open parentheses, rhyme of the Duchess May, close parentheses. And ring, ring, thou passing bell, still she cried, I the old chapel, toll slowly, then back toppling, crashing back, a dead weight flung out to rack, horse and riders overfell. And with equal art she can convey the subsequent effect of dead calm, the lethargy of reaction after that culminating stroke on which the tempestuous story ends. Then, O oh spirits, did I say, ye who rode so fast that day, toll slowly. Did star wheels and angel wings with their holy winnowings keep beside you all the way? Though in passion ye would dash with a blind and heavy crash, toll slowly. Up against the thick bossed shield of God's judgment in the field, though your heart and brain were rash, now your will is all unwilled, now your pulses are all stilled, toll slowly. Now ye lie as meek and mild, open parentheses, where so laid, close parentheses, as Maud the child, whose small grave today was filled. Beating heart and burning brow, ye are very patient now, toll slowly. And the children might be bold to pluck the king cups from your mold, ere a month had let them grow. And you let the goldfinch sing in the alder nearer in spring, toll slowly. Let her build her nest and sit all the three weeks out on it, murmuring not at anything. In your patience ye are strong, cold and heat ye take not wrong, toll slowly. When the trumpet of the angel blows eternity's evangel, time will seem to you not long. Oh, the little birds sang east, and the little birds sang west, toll slowly. And I said in underbreath, all our life is mixed with death, and who knoweth which is best? Oh, the little birds sang east, and the little birds sang west, toll slowly. And I smile to think God's greatness flowed around our incompleteness, round our restlessness, his rest. It is this intimate and subtle understanding, this instinctive knowledge minus experience, which is the peculiar characteristic of Mrs. Browning's poetry, which has enabled it to lay hold so strongly upon the hearts of that very British public which her husband has challenged as ye who like me not. The cry of the children with its poignant human sympathy, is already bearing a definite result in the reformation of evil conditions. These simple verses are more potent, perhaps, than the most eloquent oratory or the most appalling statistics. Do ye hear the children weeping, O my brothers, ere the sorrow comes with years? They are leaning their young heads against their mothers, and that cannot stop their tears. The young lambs are bleating in the meadows, the young birds are chirping in the nest. The young fawns are playing with the shadows, the young flowers are blowing toward the west. But the young, young children, oh my brothers, they are weeping bitterly. They are weeping in the playtime of the others, in the country of the free. For oh, say the children, we are weary, and we cannot run or leap. If we cared for any meadows, it were merely to drop down in them and sleep. Our knees tremble sorely in the stooping. We fall upon our faces, trying to go. And underneath our heavy eyelids drooping, the reddest flower would look as pale as snow. For all day, we drag our burden tiring through the cold, dark underground. Or all day we drive the wheels of iron in the factories round and round. For all day the wheels are droning, turning, their wind comes in our faces, till our hearts turn, our head with pulses burning, and the walls turn in their places. 
turns the sky in the high window blank and reeling, turns the long light that drops adown the wall, turn the black flies that crawl along the ceiling. All are turning all the day, and we with all. And all day the iron wheels are droning, and sometimes we could pray, O oh, ye wheels, open parentheses, breaking out in a mad moaning, close parentheses, stop, be silent for today, open parentheses, the cry of the children, close parentheses. The woman who can write this is no idle singer of an empty day but one to whose passionate mother heart one touch of nature makes the whole world kin. The matchless earnestness which has been adduced as the prominent trait of her conversation and her character find its chief outlet in her work. While my poems are full of faults, she allows, they have my heart and life in them and her firm conviction that every poem should have an object and a significance is occasionally apt to mar the artistic effect of the whole. The desire to tag on a moral, to append a didactic dissertation, or to evoke a serious symbolism from a mere featherweight of fancy does not always make for beauty. But when she reaches her topmost pinnacle, when the loveliness of thought is twinned by the loveliness of language, and both are pilgrims to some lofty shrine of meaning, then assuredly she achieves some golden orb of perfect song. Such are those consummate utterances of love in all its phases, sonnets from the Portuguese in which the whole strong clamoring of a vehement soul doth utter itself distinct. Earth's crammed with heaven, and every common bush afire with God. These sonnets may be taken to represent the deepest current of her thought, the loftiest altitude of her imagination, always on a higher plane than that of most writers. For with her everything is religion, and surely, she has insisted, it should be the gladness and the gratitude of such as are poets among us that in turning towards the beautiful, they may behold the true face of God. In sonnets from the Portuguese, the exquisite gradations of human love resolve themselves, as it were, into a mirror, wherein the true face of God is always reflected, and only in him is the mortal joy complete. The shadowy figure of death, whose wings brood vaguely dusk over these noble sonnets, becomes transformed and irradiate with celestial light, and the lightest word or look of love appears suffused with new significance, such as only the initiated can fully fathom, yet told with a tender simplicity of language that knocks at every heart. First time he kissed me, he but only kissed the fingers of this hand wherewith I write. And ever since it grew more clean and white, slow to world greetings, quick with its O list when the angels speak. A ring of amethyst I could not wear here, plainer to my sight than that first kiss. The second passed in height the first and sought my forehead and half missed, half falling on the hair. O oh, beyond me! That was the chrism of love, which love's own crown with sanctifying sweetness did proceed. The third upon my lips was folded down in perfect purple state, since when, indeed, I have been proud and said, My love, my own. Meanwhile, the stress of Tuscan noon is invading even this cool and shadowed room. Florence, outside the window, seems to seethe in this Medean boil-pot of the sun, and all the patient hills are bubbling round, as if a prick would leave them flat, and the fiery thread-paper of a woman, who is pouring out her sensitive heart in lines which she feels to her very fingertips, 
is growing exhausted by her morning's effort, not the less so that the political poems upon which she is engaged, by the very fervor which they evoke, tax her vitality to the uttermost. It is almost impossible for any stranger to comprehend Elizabeth Barrett Browning's ardent love for Italy. She has become more Italian than the Italians themselves, and all her patriots, rather than her compatriots, find a welcome and a rendezvous at Casa Guidi. The fervency of her feelings is redoubled by the unusual setting of her life, its former solitude and present comparative isolation. All her feelings on political subjects are intensified, not only by her woman's impetuosity, it has been said, but by the circumstances of her secluded life. Her judgments, both for good and bad, seem oftentimes like those of a dweller in some city convent. She is at once forbearing and dogmatic, willing to accept differences, resolute to admit no argument concerning things of which, open parentheses, even with the intuition of genius, close parentheses, she can know little. No aid of books or friends can supply that daily contact which active life alone can give. She is without any more practical knowledge of actual life than a nun might be when, after long years, she emerged from her cloister and her shroud. So various friends have described her, and the truth of their description deepens daily, for the famous poetess is practically almost as much of a recluse, a wife and mother in Casa Guidi, as in the old sepulchral London days. No longer is she able for visits to Vallombrosa, being conveyed in a grape basket without wheels drawn by oxen, or losing herself in distant forests and scrambling on muleback up the sources of extinct volcanoes. Her precarious hold on life is relaxing, slowly but surely, year by year, and her own impetuosity burns her away from within. Chiefly, as has been hinted, her hopes and fears for Italy are absolutely wearing her out, and she has pinned her faith to a broken reed, did she know it, the Emperor Napoleon III. For him, as the potential savior of Italy, as the deus ex machina, who shall free the land from shore to shore, for that inscrutable and untrustworthy man, Elizabeth Barrett Browning cherishes the most astounding admiration. Nothing can weaken it, nothing cast a doubt upon his bona fides. The sane, sound reasoning of her husband does not, in this case, weigh a jot against her desperate belief. And now she is commemorating his deeds in lines unintelligible to ordinary English thought, and hailing him as a hero, because she says, He might have had the world with him, but choose to side with suffering men and had the world against him when he came to deliver Italy, emperor evermore. Open parentheses, Napoleon III in Italy, close parentheses. Spent with the emphasis of her own ardor, the poetess drops her pen and rests her silky head upon a spirit small hand, her great eyes still glowing with the thoughts that have fired them. At that moment, she fulfills to the last detail her husband's description of his lyric love, half angel and half bird, and all a wonder and a wild desire. And so he thinks as gently entering and stooping over her. He calls her by her pet name, Ba, and begs her to desist a while from work. Montaigne says somewhere, she replies with quaint humor, that to stop gracefully is sure sign of high race in a horse. That is just what I have done. And she covers up her manuscripts, for they are never obtrusively in evidence while not in use. Lunch is presently awaiting them, and afterwards through the fierce heat of the afternoon, Mrs. Browning rests herself, more or less reluctantly. After four o'clock, she is open to receive visitors, though indeed she sometimes postpones being visible to strangers until 8 p.m. And the visitors who are expected duly arrive, rather important ones, being Nathaniel Hawthorne and his wife. 
Oddly enough, Mrs. Browning's popularity in America is greater than in England, and the English folk who call at Casa Guidi are few and far between, compared with the constant stream of American poet worshippers. The Hawthorns, very much impressed with everything they see, from vestibule to drawing room, are seated at the long, narrow table placed before the hostess's inveterate sofa. Nathaniel Hawthorne, that dark, silent man of spiritual nature, but more like a gnome than a sylph, becomes lost in admiration of Panini, who, clad in a buff silk tunic embroidered with white, open parentheses, for although nine years old, he is still, according to early Victorian custom, in frocks and socks, close parentheses, flits about, graceful as Ganymede, and hands round cake and strawberries. Other visitors soon arrive, and Robert Browning, who seems to be in all parts of the room and in every group at the same moment, is revealed as a host par excellence, cultured, cordial, full of robust common sense combined with lofty ideals. Panini sometimes adds his childish trouble to the talk, sometimes sits down and apparently enjoys his own meditations. No conversation in Casa Guidi can ever languish for want of material, still less can it proceed for very long without inevitably trending towards the subject which Mrs. Browning takes so terribly to heart, as one of her friends has said. Next to the thought of Italy, her whole interest is at present focused on and absorbed in spiritualism, to which from its first introduction she has lent an ear as credulous as her trust was sincere and her heart high-minded. And she endorses to the full in practice the words of Oliver Wendell Holmes. Life as we call it is nothing but the edge of the boundless ocean of existence when it comes on soundings. In this view, I don't see anything so fit to talk about or half so interesting as that which relates to the innumerable majority of our fellow creatures, the dead living, who are hundreds of thousands to one of the live living, and to whom we all potentially belong. Though we have got tangled for the present in some parcels of fibrin, albumen, and phosphates that keep us on the minority side of the house, to a woman who confesses that most of my events and nearly all of my intense pleasures have passed in thoughts, this subject is one of extraordinary fascination, and her husband's profound disbelief is a trouble to her. Truth to tell, he makes no secret of it, and the author of Mr. Sludge the Medium need say little more to demonstrate his opinions. However, through sheer force of habit, he joins with energy in the general discussion, taking a directly opposite view to his wife. And when the argument, which both seem to enjoy, has left off exactly at the point where it began, the guests adroitly turn the conversation upon those poems of their hostess, which are founded upon a supernatural motif, notably the Lay of the Brown Rosary. To her, it may be, there is but little difference between the human and the superhuman, between dreams and realities. So abnormally thin is the thread of mortality which binds her to terrestrial facts. As she has expressed it, poetry is essentially truthfulness, and the very incoherences of poetic dreaming are but the struggle and the strife to reach the true, the unknown. Therefore, the story of the brown rosary may be considered that of a dream, yet, if you please to call it a dream, the authoress quotes Cowley, I shall not take it ill, because the father of poets tells us even dreams, too, are from God. The plot is one of the most remarkable in the English language, that of a compact between a living, loving maiden agonizing to retain her life and love, and an unholy elemental of the darkness. Evil Spirit Who told thee thou wast called to death? Honora in sleep. 
I sate all night beside thee. The grey owl on the ruined wall shut both his eyes to hide thee, and ever he flapped his heavy wing all brokenly and weak, and the long grass waved against the sky around his gasping beak. I sate beside thee all the night, while the moonlight lay forlorn, strewn round us like a dead world's shroud in ghastly fragments torn. And through the night, and through the hush, and over the flapping wing, we heard beside the heavenly gate the angels murmuring. We heard them say, put day to day, and count the days to seven. On the opposite page is the poem Enora and the Spirit of the Sun. I sate all night beside thee. The grey owl on the ruined wall shut both his eyes to hide thee. I vowed to thee on rosary. Open parentheses, dead father, look not so. Close parentheses. I would not thank God in my weal, nor seek God in my woe. Open parentheses, lay of the brown rosary. Close parentheses. And God will draw Honora up the golden stairs of heaven, and yet the evil ones have leave that purpose to defer. For if she has no need of him, he has no need of her. Evil spirit, speak out to me, speak bold and free. Honora in sleep. And then I heard thee say, I count upon my rosary brown the hours thou hast to stay. Yet God permits us evil ones to put by that decree. Since if thou hast no need of him, he has no need of thee. And if thou wilt forego the sight of angels verily, thy true love gazing on thy face shall guess what angels be. I vowed upon thy rosary brown this string of antique beads, by charnel lichens overgrown and dank among the weeds. This rosary brown, which is thine own, lost soul of buried nun, who lost by vow, wouldst render now all souls unlike undone. I vowed upon thy rosary brown, until such vow should break, a pledge always of living days t'was hung around my neck. I vowed to thee on rosary, open parentheses, dead father, look not so, close parentheses. I would not thank God in my weal, nor seek God in my woe. Open parentheses, the lay of the brown rosary, close parentheses. In this, as in almost all her poems, Elizabeth Barrett Browning has worked out her invariable theory of life, that humanity is purified and made perfect by suffering, by suffering only that knowledge by suffering entereth and life is perfected by death. This is the text of all she has ever written, from the exquisite tenderness of Cowper's grave to the hard-won joy in which Aurora Lee looks heavenward with her blind lover. Evening closes in. The guests are gone. The small black-robed figure stands upon the flower-breathing balcony, leaning on her husband's arm and watching the dusk droop downward over Florence, as she has watched it so many happy nights. Often she has noted with delicate details of perception, how the heavens were making room to hold the night, the sevenfold heavens unfolding all their gates to let the stars out slowly. The purple and transparent shadows slow had filled up the whole valley to the brim and flooded all the city, which you saw as some drowned city in some enchanted sea. Then a kiss, as long and silent as the ecstatic night, and deep, 
deep, shuddering breaths, which meant beyond whatever could be told by word or kiss. I fain would write it down here like the rest, to keep it in my eyes as in my ears, the heart's sweet scripture to be read at night when weary, or at morning when afraid, and lean my heaviest oath on when I swear that when all's done, all tried, all counted here, all great arts, and all good philosophies, this love just puts its hand out in a dream and straight outstretches all things. Open parentheses, Aurora Lee, close parentheses. And the last and sweetest treasure for that hand of love to grasp is now awaiting her, the sight of her sleeping child. She makes her way to his bedside and bends above her darling son. She has already drawn his likeness as he lies there, warm and moist with life to the bottom of his dimples, to the ends of the lovely tumbled curls about his face. He saw his mother's face, accepting it in change for heaven itself with such a smile as might have well been learnt there, never moved, but smiled on in a drowse of ecstasy. So happy, open parentheses, half with her, and half with heaven, close parentheses. He could not have the trouble to be stirred, but smiled and lay there. Like a rose, I said, as red and still indeed as any rose that blows in all the silence of its leaves, content in blowing to fulfill its life. She leaned above him, open parentheses, drinking him as wine, close parentheses, in that extremity of love twill pass for agony or rapture, open parentheses, Aurora Lee, close parentheses. And thus, compassed by a sense of perpetual benediction, of strength made perfect in weakness, of life as a continual sacrament to man, since Christ break the daily bread of it in his hands, Elizabeth Barrett Browning ends her day. More softly than the dew is shed, or cord is floated overhead, he giveth his beloved sleep. And while the midsummer stars of Italy blaze above the Arno, and the long, warm twilight turns northward towards the dawn, those who have been privileged to speak with her are musing in her own phrases. You have shown me truths, O oh June Day friend, that help me now at night when June is over. Truths not yours indeed, but set within my reach by means of you. Open parentheses, Aurora Lee. Close parentheses. End of chapter 6. Recording by Marie Hoffman.